Okay, good. Um, so historically, uh, the reason to propose inflation uh, were driven by two two observations. The first one is that uh, that the universe appears homogeneous on on scales that are or were super horizon at the moment that the CMB had formed. This is known as the horizon problem, and I'll, I'll explain this in a little bit more detail um, next. And then the other thing is that the universe looks uh, uh, geometrically flat, and that has some. Um, that's basically a, a non-attractor non solution, if you will. Um, it solved also a bunch of other things, which are maybe not so evident. Uh, the absence of magnetic monopoles, uh, topological defects. Um, and later on, which is, I think, maybe one of the important factors why inflation has uh, or is, is considered as the most viable theory of the early universe, is that it was realized that you could also generate this spectrum of fluctuations, which of course then seed uh, structure formation. Uh, but then looking at the observed spectrum of fluctuations, there are some other things that actually require something like inflation to happen. So while initially it was more like, what are the global properties of our universe and, uh, and why uh, and, and inflation as a solution of these of these global uh, conundrums, and then later on at the level of the fluctuations, people realize well, inflation seems to a be able to produce such a spectrum, but also some of the apparent um, uh, properties of that spectrum are almost a unique prediction of an inflationary period. And these two other problems are uh, referred to as the coherence problem and uh, the co the scale invariance problem. I wouldn't really call them problems, but um, okay. So let us first start with the um, with the flatness problem. So I I I try to avoid introducing curvature, <laughs> and now I have to. Otherwise, we cannot talk about the flatness problem. Um, but the main point is that my Friedman equation, my first Friedman equation is modified. So uh, instead of having h squared equals 8 pi g um, over 3 rho, where rho now represents all the densities, right? Cos uh, the cosmological constant, matter, and radiation. I have a correction which goes like the curvature squared, uh, sorry, curvature over a squared. Okay, so this is this is fine. So there's a correction to the Friedman equation, um, and with that, of course, in principle, I can put this back into uh, this part of the the term. So treat the curvature as some density, and if I do that, I can define the associated density parameter rho k, which is uh, k over h squared, a squared at any given time, and then measured today, of course, this is replaced by h naught squared, okay? Um, and what we can see is that, with, based on observations, is that this, this uh, curvature parameter, density parameter today, is roughly um, zero plus <laughs> minus 0 0.005, okay? So there's no evidence for curvature in the universe. Now, why is that problematic? Um, if I write down, I can write down the evolution of this curvature by writing down the time derivative of this curvature parameter or curvature density as a function of uh, time. And if you use the second Friedman equation, you can show that this is proportional to minus a prime prime times 2k over a uh, prime cubed. And then this is proportional to, uh, without constants here, a over a prime cubed rho plus 3p. Okay, 
right? Um, so what does it tell us? Now, this is proportional to 1 plus 3w, right? Where w is the equation of state. Um, and we know for a fact that in our universe, when the universe is radiation or matter dominated, that a prime, um, so a prime is larger than zero, that we know. And we also know that 1 plus, uh, 1 plus 3w is also larger than zero for radiation and matter, right? So 1 plus 3w is also larger than zero. So that means that the, the time derivative of this uh, parameter, uh, d omega k dt, also is larger than zero. So if it was, if it's, if it was, if it's small now, right, it has to, well, if it's zero now or very close to zero, then it must have been smaller in the past even, okay? So that's the, the flatness problem. The fact that somehow, given that it's so close to zero now, and perhaps it's exactly zero, well, it is, if it's exactly zero, then this problem is over, but then the question is why is it exactly zero? Um, but the main point is that if it's not exactly zero, then it must have been smaller in the past. And the question is why would it be smaller in the past? Right, so this is a flatness problem. Okay, so what are the solutions of this flatness problem? Okay, Do we, can we already come up with some solutions? Well, the first one maybe is less, uh, the least appealing, or maybe the second one is the least appealing, uh, depending on your, uh, on your opinion, on your own personal preferences. But the first one would be fine tuning, yeah? It's just, uh, this is what you could do, just make it even smaller, okay, you know, and the universe started out with a very small value that is much smaller than it is today, that's much smaller than it is today, but okay, that's it. Maybe not so uh, great. Another one is sometimes refers, referred to as anthropic, which basically states <clears throat> that that's just the way it is. <laughs> that's at least uh, how I interpret it. So if we not, if we didn't have this value, then maybe we would not be in this universe, and therefore we wouldn't observe it. And uh, we are observing it, and that's because it, you know, that kind of gives you the the reason why. It has to be this small. For example, if it was much larger, maybe humans would not exist and could not measure it. Not very appealing as well, right? So now the other, the f yeah. Yeah, so if, if it was not super small in the past, then it would have been quite large today. Yes, yeah. Yeah, I, th I think in some sense that's why I was saying it's kind of like a, it's a non-attractor solution, right? So you, if you start out with some curvature, you end up with a lot of curvature. And now it's weird that today we have almost no curvature, yeah. Um, and so you want a model that would make this kind of an attractor solution again, that the universe has small curvature because that's what the equations tell you. Um, and it's a natural, natural evolution. So what could you do? Well, if we go back to this equation here, yeah, if you want this to be negative, you can make, right? So there's two ways to make this negative. <laughs> uh, yeah, so you can make, we can make d, d omega k dt less than zero if either a prime prime is less than zero and a prime is less than zero. So be number one. Or a prime prime double prime is larger than zero and 
A prime is oxygen, zero is solution two. And quite generally, this, this kind of solution is also a solution in principle. It's known as a bounce, or the universe went through some bounce or is going through a bounce. Uh, and this is, uh, this is uh, accelerated expansion, which is inflation. Yeah. So you see already that inflation as a solution appears here. OK. So these are two, two flatness. What about the, the second problem? So the Ryzen problem. Uh, well, we know that the CMB is uniform, right? Have roughly ha oh, it, it has anisotropies, but by and large, the, a the average temperature is, uh, is, uh, is almost constant, right? So the temperature of the CMB is roughly 3 Kelvin. And the fluctuations of order are order 10 minus 5. And it's 3 Kelvin in each and every direction. Um, and so we can consider the following. We can consider the co-moving distance between two, um, uh, two times. So let's uh, write this as xi. Remember xi is basically c times tau. And tau is uh, the conformal, conformal time. Um, so we can define psi between A1 and A2. And then specifically, we can consider the situation where I'm looking at an object uh, this way and I'm looking at an object that way. And, and I can derive what the distance between, the co-moving co distance between these two objects is in our universe today, yes. Um, so let's write this in the following way. So obviously if I, that means I have to look at some time and I, I take, this is the furthest way I can, I, I can look and then I look at the other side. So how do I define this? I define this as two times psi between um, A and one. Yeah, A is undefined here. One of course is today. Our skill factor today is one, and this is given by the integral of a to one, two times dA over a squared h, that we saw yesterday when the definition of tau. And this is equivalent to one over h naught, uh, four over three w plus one, 1 minus a to the power 3w plus 1 over 2. So this is a general solution which holds uh, unless w is exactly minus 1 third. Okay, so this solution is correct only for uh, unless uh, w is minus 1 third. Okay. Now, if we ignore a recent phase of dark energy, where for which W is minus 1, then this is roughly equal to oh, 4 times H naught uh, over times 2, uh, sorry, times 1 over 3 omega plus 1, or W plus 1. And this is of order 1 over H naught. Okay, so the two furthest objects away are sky. Their conformal, the conformal distance between two objects is roughly one over h naught. Okay. All right. So now <clears throat> that's the first step. We can. Um, consider the following. We consider what is known as the uh, co-moving particle horizon. Right, so before we consider the co-moving distance, now we can cons consider the co-moving particle horizon, and that's def defined as the, as the distance light could have traveled from some initial time to some uh, end time. So we can write this as 
following. So xi 0 to a, sorry, 0 to a. So remember, above, we were working between two different times, and then we were measuring it up to today. Now we're measuring it from some initial time, which could, we could set to 0 uh, up to um, some uh, expansion factor, uh, some scale factor a. OK, if we do that, we have the following integral running from 0 to a, d a twiddle a twiddle squared h a twiddle. And this is equivalent to 1 over a h 2 3 w plus 1, which is of order 1 over a h. Um, and we actually call this um, the particle horizon, RH, okay? So that's defined as the particle horizon. Um, now, if we assume that the uh, expansion rate has been decelerating, which is true for radiation and matter, then, so if, um, Assuming that a prime prime is less than uh, zero, then we can write. So this is true for matter and radiation. Then we can write the ratio of these two. So we can write psi. A, sorry, zero one, sorry, a one over psi zero a, which is roughly equivalent to two times a h over h naught, which is two times a minus three w plus one over two. Now, because, again, uh, 3w plus 1 over 2 is larger than z 0 and a prime, sorry, a is less than 1 or much less than 1 in this case, right, because we're talking about radiation going to, let's say, the moment of last scattering, the C and B, so a was much less than 1, and so a, C and B is much, much less than 1. That makes us to conclude that this is much, much larger than 1. Yeah. So this tells us that the size of the universe, whatever the, the, the region that could have been thermalized and therefore create a homogeneous CMB temperature background, is much uh, smaller than um, the region that we observe to be in thermal equilibrium today. And this is called the Horizon problem, okay, so that's problem number two. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, let's leave the flatness problem and the horizon problem. So, um, are there any solutions to this? Well, we already know there is a solution, but let's still run through the options. Um, solutions. So the possible solutions are if there is, again, a phase of accelerated expansion, yeah? So consider A prime prime larger than zero. And another way of saying that is that W has to be less than minus one third, okay? And of course, later we'll see what we need is something like W equals minus one. Now, the point here is that when we computed the, um, the particle horizon, we took the integral from 0 to A, 
And if a prime prime is uh, larger than zero, you cannot do that. And so you have to be careful when you compute the particle horizon in that case. So if there was a period of accelerated expansion between, let's say, a initial and a end, okay, a period of expansion between these two periods, then I can write, again, my uh, conformal distance as a initial, a or let's say final, I think I use a final, uh, equals 1 over a f h f 2 over 3 w plus 1 times a f over a initial to the power 3 w plus 1 absolute over 2 minus 1. Okay. Which is approximately equal to 1 over a f h f 2 3 w plus 1 times a f over a i let's come all the way 3 w plus 1 over 2 this minus 1 doesn't matter too much so as long as a i is much much less than a f so as long as a i is much less than a f um, we find that this thing is much, much larger than R H. The co-moving Hubble radius, okay? And specifically, if you choose W equals minus 1, you find that this object is 1 over A H. Uh, initial. And that's what we need, right? Because we need to thermalize a very large patch, uh, and that can happen when you have a period of accelerated expansion that goes way beyond the region that we, well, at least it could easily reach the region that we observe today. Right? That's the main point, as long as it's larger than H0. Okay, so again, in principle, um, an accelerated universe saves the day, or accelerated expansion saves the day. Uh, and that's a f that was the reason, plus the other two things that I mentioned before, the, the, the absence of magnetic monopoles and uh, topological defects, that led people to uh, propose in the 80s by uh, several independent, uh, independent scientists, so Andre Linde, Ganley Good, Sarobinsky, um, they proposed uh, inflation to solve this. Um, okay, any questions about this so far before we move on? Probably some of you have seen this already. Okay, now then the spectrum of fluctuations was observed that introduced a bunch of new problems. You would think that observing something would maybe solve some problems, but it Use new problems, but the nice thing is that, of course, that inflation solved this. Okay, so as said before, it seems that um, the universe is isotropic and homogeneous and has a uniform temperature at, at, at uh, cold moving scales that are proportional to 1 over H0. Um, and it's also coherent. The fluctuations in our universe are also coherent on that scale. Right, so this is the phase coherence. fluctuations. Okay, so take uh, the specific example of temperature and E-mode polarization as anisotropies, and for that I need to share my screen. Um, yep. 
Okay. So what you see here in this uh, figure is uh, the the CMB temperature E mode polarization uh, cross correlation. So in this case, they call uh, they name this DL, which is really nothing more than two L plus one times C L T E over two pi. Um, and the main point here is that. Um, you see on very large scales that these modes are correlated. And on very large scales, it means roughly anything below L of 70, in this case, in spherical harmonic uh, multiple moments, uh, was sub-horizon uh, or close to sub-horizon at, uh, or super-horizon, sorry, uh, when the scene was formed, right? So now the question is why are these fluctuations coherent on these very large scales. And so we can make this a little bit more uh, rigorous. Yes? Well, so if they are uncoherent, then their, their correlation function would be zero. Yeah, but it's non-zero. Yeah, so that's what I mean. OK, so let's write this thing down. So what we have to do here is we have to do the correlation function of the ALMs associated, right? Remember the ALMs are just uh, the spherical harmonic coefficients associated with the fluctuations. So we can write ALM T, and then we do the same thing for the E mode polarization. And this is equivalent to delta L, L prime, delta M, M prime, C, L, T, E, okay? So what can we say about this C, L, T, E without doing much calculations? <laughs> Well, um, of course, in principle, you can try and work out all the, all the physics of this, but we can make a few approximations. So on very large scales, effectively, we saw already that your, uh, your temperature part follows the, the fluctuations in the, in the radiation, radiation density, yeah, on very large scales. And um, uh, similarly, for the... The E modes, they, they are actually not proportional to the density, but they are, uh, um, they are actually proportional to the divergence of the, uh, of the velocity. Yeah, without any derivation of this, but I'm just going to tell you that. So that means that T can be written as something like, or proportional to delta, yeah, as a function of T and X. Well, my E modes are proportional to um, the divergence of the velocity. Okay, so that's, again, it's just a proxy. This is by no means exact, but we want to kind of see roughly what this coherence implies. So then if I think about any of these fluctuations as, as waves, which turns out to be the case, right, they can be described by, by waves. And so let's write down general form of, of this uh, fluctuation, density fluctuation in terms of uh, uh, a wave. And then we also, for simplicity, move to, um, uh, move to 1D. So I'm just going to write Tx, move the, the vector notation here. So I can write that my wave is something like A times uh, cosine Kx sine um, well, so I have a cosine, cosine omega t plus some phase. Okay. Now, if we use the linearized fluid equations, you can basically show that this is simply uh, related to the the time derivative, so we have the velocities related to the time derivative. Um, okay, so if we use that, Ooh. we find that this thing equates to W A um, cosine, sorry, K X sine omega t plus phi. 
Okay. So we have some ex some kind of closed expressions for my density uh, fluctuations in the form of a wave, as well as the divergence of the velocity. So having written down these approximations of these two contributions, I can now do the correlation function. And the only thing I have to sh I have to make some assumptions about the distribution of phases and the distribution of amplitudes. Now again, because we know that these are by, by construction on scales that could not have communicated with one another, so if I look at two different patches on, uh, on the sky and I correlate these modes, they're separated by, um, uh, by a distance that's uh, much larger than the, the particle horizon, the cosmic particle horizon. And so if I have to make an assumption, I can say, okay, perhaps these phases and amplitudes are described by um, a flat distribution. And that means if I correlate now T with E, which is basically saying I'm correlated delta with the divergence of V, then this is equivalent to um, the correlation of these A's. So I have, don't even have to say much about the amplitudes in this case. And then there's an integral from 0 to 2 pi of um, uh, d phi, the phase cosine omega t plus phi sine omega t plus phi. And this is zero. Okay, so if I had no idea or if I have no mo motivation to think that these phases are correlated, I find that the correlation between t and e should be zero. And uh, and that's what we do not see, right? And so then, again, this, so this is called the coherence problem. And of course, it turns out that inflation uh, helps you out in that regard. Okay, now the final thing that I want to bring up before we move on to actually deriving a model of inflation is uh, the apparent scale uh, or scale invariance of your spectrum. Okay? Okay, so let's go back to uh, what we did yesterday. So we write up, this is approximate scale invariance. Um, remember that we derived the, uh, the transfer functions yesterday, and you can show that on, and actually you'll show to tomorrow with Will in Will's uh, tutorial, you show the different contributions, right? Remember we had the Sachs-Wolf contribution, the Doppler contribution, and the integrated Sachs-Wolf contribution, and the Sachs-Wolf contribution dominates on large scales. Okay, so then I can write that my fluctuations today in direction n, so this is, in, remember this is delta t over t, is given by a fourth, sorry, one fourth delta gamma plus psi at last scattering. So this is the, right, this is the Sachs-Wolf contribution. Now there's also, again, a contribution on large scales from the integrated Sachs-Wolf effect, uh, but that's subdominant still, okay? So we can ignore it for now. And then uh, another thing which I'll not discuss, but if you assume what is called adiabatic initial conditions, you can derive the relation between the different perturbations at last scattering. And uh, what you'll find then if you do this um, that this is equivalent one to one third psi star, which is related to one fifth of the curvature perturbations. Again, I'm not going to show that here. I refer to any textbook for the, for actually explaining this. Now, if that's the case, so R, there's we had R i if you want um, for initial. Um, 
That means that if we look at what the transfer of functions look like, yeah, based on how we, uh, how we wrote uh, these transfer functions theta L yesterday, then my Sox-Wolf transfer function, unfortunately, again, we use theta for the transfer function as well, uh, but using delta also leads to confusion. But whenever there's a subscript L, it's a transfer function. This transfer function is given by one-fifth times the spherical be Bessel function K psi last scattering. Okay, so this is our transfer function. Now, that means I can compute my power spectrum, right? Remember, our, my power spectrum is just CL times 4 pi integral dk over k transfer function squared multiplied by my initial conditions. Um, and it turns out that if you plug in this as your transfer function, you can compute this. Um, uh, you can show that what's required um, for this to have no skill dependence, then this also doesn't cannot have any skill dependence. So this is almost so this does almost not depend on k. And so the reason why we think it's not skill dependent is because of this. So if I look on very large scales here, right, it seems that uh, it's almost flat. There's a little bit of scale dependence, but okay. It's almost flat on very large scales. So that means that because DL, right, because DL is defined as L squared CL, then CL, and for, order, for this to be flat, right, for this to be a constant, CL has to be proportional to 1 over L squared. And you can do this integral analytically, and it's actually shown in, the, in, the, in, in my notes, that for, or, for this to be true, uh, then this object should be independent of scale. So that means that your primordial fluctuations are scale invariant. And that's why this is called, well, it's called approximate because it's not exactly scale invariant, but close to scale invariant. And the question is why, okay? So why is it scale invariant? How do you get a spectrum of scale invariant perturbations? Okay. So what does scale invariance really mean? When we talk about this, I just bring it up, but what does it technically mean in, in terms of fluctuations? Okay. Um, yes. Okay. So what do we mean by skill invariant spectrum? Well, what we mean is that we have some correlation. Um, and now I'm going to, well, I'm going to use X for now, so I'm using real space. Uh, and then this has to be equivalent to R lambda times x1, R lambda times x2. Okay, that's what it means to be scale invariant. Now, I can write down a, um, a metric so if the early universe somehow, because of course we're looking for a solution of the spectrum in the early universe, if the early universe can be described by the following metric, ds squared equals a squared minus d tau squared plus dx squared, uh, but then specifically with a squared equals uh, tau h squared, yeah, and h is a constant, it's fixed in this universe, in this metric, then there is in fact a 
there is a symmetry, and that is um, that if I change tau to lambda tau, and I change x to lambda x, then the, the metric is invariant. Okay, so that's the symmetry. And this is called a, uh, it's called a dilaton. Now, which is not super important, but the main thing is if there's no other things that uh, could, could kind of potentially break this symmetry, then this is an approximate symmetry of the entire theory, and therefore it holds. So for this, if you choose a, what is called, so this is actually called the sitter metric. So we, if, if there is a the sitter phase in the universe, then we have approximate, um, we, have this, we have this approximate symmetry of the theory, and that leads for this to be true. And, uh, and this results in a spectrum that is approximately scale invariant. Okay, so if the universe underwent the Sitter phase, or there was uh, the Sitter phase in the early universe, then we do not. Then we have uh, we predict that the spectrum of fluctuations uh, is scale invariant or close to scale invariant. Okay. Um, any questions about this? Yeah. Um, I don't, I think, so a bounds will lead to a different spectrum, I think, um, of fluctuations. Maybe, does it have a blue, it has a blue tail probably, right? Naturally. Bounds? Huh? The? Yes. You can also have a red tail. Yeah. So I think in principle a bounce could do many, could be do almost the same, right? That's why the bounce is considered by some as a viable alternative. Uh, I could have a whole uh, hour just devoted to the battle between the bouncers and the inflationists, uh, which is quite severe, to be honest. Like they, they don't, uh, they hardly talk to one another. Um, but the main, okay, so what, maybe a little bit of background. So it's, so obviously inflation was proposed uh, to solve some of these conundrums. And in some sense saying, oh, if we have inflation, we resolve these initial condition problems, right? Because we create a universe that's thermalized, that's very close to flat, um, and has no monopoles, whatever. So you, you kind of solve it, but then, there was also like there was also people saying, but in order to get a period of inflation, requires very specific conditions as well. So in some sense, the argument was you're pushing the fine tuning problem to before inflation, and so that's when people said, okay, maybe we need a new new solution, and having a bounce in principle could solve that because then the initial conditions are set by the previous cycle. Yeah, so if the universe goes through a bounce, that whatever those, those conditions that were there during the previous cycle set the conditions now uh, for the, the right conditions now for, for the universe that we observe today. But of course, to the, and then the argument would be this bounce would go on forever and ever, so if I go back in time, you know, it just, it will just bounce forever. Like it just goes, it expands, and then it contracts, and then there's a bounce, and it expands. Of course, in the end, that leads to the same conundrum, which is that then you push this initial condition back to the first bounce. Yeah. So in my mind, it, that doesn't necessarily solve this problem. Uh, but it's still true that there is a, there is a debate about how to, in any kind of fundamental theory, let's say you know, your favorite UV complete path theory is string theory. How do you 
how do you make uh, how do you cre create the necessary conditions to have inflation and that's not so that's not so clear I, th I think at least well some people is like evident everything leads to inflation that's one way but there's I think also especially people working more on the fund on sort of on the fundamental parts of string theory that it's not so easy in, in particular what you need, as you see here, is the sitter phase, while string theory, I think, naturally leads to anti the sitter. So how do you how do you make that work? Uh, and that's not we right. We don't we don't we don't observe that the universe went to the sitter phase. We oh sorry, yeah, anti the sitter phase it must be the sitter phase. Okay, but anyways, that that's kind of um, I don't want to spend too much time on this debate, but it is there. Yeah, um, and the bounds could be a solution. It's just that a lot of people, there's a lot of people have kind of put their money on inflation. Um, actually, I don't know. I don't know why historically that that happened. I mean, it started with inflation, and, and then at some point people came up with the bounds. But yeah, okay, so. I have one question for you guys. So I had I spoke to a few people and they said we really want to have a short break in in the middle. Should I should we do a vote on this break? Okay, who wants to have a break? Oh, there's one person. <laughs> Yesterday there were more people who said that. Okay, then we'll just continue. Okay. All right. So, let's move on. Uh and in fact, I mean we're kind of halfway, I think. Are there any more questions about this? Because now we move on to actually writing down a theory of inflation. Okay, good. Well, during inflation, it, it hardly changes, right? Yeah, uh, only at the end of inflation. It, yeah, 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 yeah. And that's also, of course, this whole the whole point is that this symmetry is an well, it's, it's approximate anyways because we don't live in the sitter. Yeah, so it's not the, the universe not, was not exactly the sitter, but close to it. Okay, we'll we'll get to that. Okay, so now we'll talk about single field. Slow roll. Oh, wait, we got to the slow roll story. Okay, so people came up with uh, an idea. So the main point that we that we addressed before is that what we need, right, based on this uh, argument of um, the horizon problem, that we need to have a particle horizon. Uh, that shrinks, right? Shrinks. Shrinks. Right, so remember that R, we called RH was defined as 1 over A, H. Okay? So people tend to draw this image of what inflation should do. Um, and it's, this figures also in the in the notes, but I'm gonna try and draw it. <laughs> so we have time or whatever any any kind of evolution parameter. Doesn't matter if it's time or a. On the horizontal axis, so we're moving that way. And then we have scale on the y uh, on the vertical axes, and the, the the particle horizon has to shrink during a period, and when inflation ends, we know that one way or another, any type of degrees or any energy density in the inflaton or the inflation or what? Well, I didn't haven't talked about the inflaton, but whatever energy is available uh, in this uh, in this field that drives inflation, 
uh, will be transferred to radiation and matter. And then we know that uh, 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 1 over AH grows, right? The, the, the um, particle horizon. And it grows like this. And early on, it's quite steep because it's radiation. And then later, it will be matter, which will be slower, OK? And of course, after this, when dark energy starts to dominate again, right? so quite recently, dark energy dominates. And then, in principle, the the particle rises, shrinks again, right? Um, but OK, it's very recent. You can then follow a fixed scale, yeah, which at some point leaves this particle horizon. When it leaves the particle horizon, it freezes and then re-enters, OK? So here it exits this particle horizon. And here it enters. And if we observe that, so of course the CMB roughly forms around matter radiation equality. So if we call this matter radiation equality, um, yeah, so roughly the CMB is formed here, where we have, of course, a mode, a temperature mode, right? Some temperature mode coming out. So if that's coming in here. We want these all to be uh, thermalized, right? So um, that's kind of the image that people have, right? So this, again, is 1 over AH, this line. The moment that this turns around is sometimes called reheating, or mostly called. It's actually not sometimes, often called reheating. OK? And this is a period of inflation. And this is then a period of radiation, domination, and then later on. You get matter domination, so that's from here on, right? I don't know where to draw it, but this here is matter dom domination. OK, so this is the, the, the history, in some sense, in terms of how scales evolve in our universe um, in a nutshell. And this is required to have, so anything that exits the horizon could have been, in, was inside this particle horizon. Everything nicely is nicely thermalized. Everything that's here is thermalized and then exits. And therefore, as observed today, at some later point, uh, all these modes appear to be uni uniform, right? So that's um, what's happening. Now we can, um, See. Um, we can make some of these things a little bit more rigorous. In particular, what we want to do, of course, to solve the horizon problem is that we need a certain amount of time um, of inflation, in some sense, the time of inflation, but we convert that to the number of so-called e folds. So we need a certain time of expansion, a certain expansion to, to be able to say that uh, the universe is thermalized on the on the on the size on the on the size uh, the universe is today. Well, if let's say <coughs> we would wait another another Hubble time, yeah, of course none of us can do that, but if we could. Uh, it might, it might be possible that somehow we start to see deviations from a thermal equilibrium, right? So maybe if we wait another Hubble time, all of a sudden we, we don't see uniform temperature, but in one direction, like it's no longer 3 Kelvin, but 8 Kelvin, yeah? So then we know that inflation has inflated the universe exactly enough to thermalize our observed universe today, but not anything more. And that's, in some sense, uh, what sets kind of an, uh, a lower limit to the amount of inflation that you need to have in order to explain the horizon as we observe it. And of course, it can be more if we wait more Hubble times and it still remains uniform, then inflation must have uh, lasted maybe for longer. Okay, so... Um, so the main point is that um, 
Um, we observe coherence, right? Coherence and, and a uniform temperature, right? on uh, scales that are of order 1 over h naught, the Hubble, uh, Hubble parameters of today. And so we can define what is called the number of e-folds, which is n is the natural logarithm of the amount of the scale factor at the end of inflation divided by the scale factor. Sorry. Uh, at the beginning of inflation, sorry. Yes. Right, so this is end, and this is beginning. Say what? Who? Oh, yeah. Initial. Sorry. Very good. Very good. Okay. Yeah, and I used F before, so that's also very confusing. Um, maybe I should stick to one thing. Um, now, the amount of expansion after inflation ends depends on the reheating temperature. Okay, so when did this happen? And we can write this in the following way. Uh, and for that, we actually have to, well, for simplicity, we assume that radiation dominated all the way through. There are small corrections when you when you do this more exact, but uh, these are small corrections. And during radiation domination, we know that H scales as A to the minus 2, right? Because you take the square root of rho, and rho scales like A to the minus 4, so this scales like A to the minus 2. Uh, then we can write that A0 times H0 and H, sorry, AR over HR. Yeah, so in this case, AR is associated with the moment that reheating takes place. Um, and we can write this as A0 over AR times um, AR over A0 squared, which is AR over A0, which is proportional to TR over, sorry, T0 over TR, right? So the temperature today over the reheating temperature, and this we can write in the following way, uh, as 10 to the minus 28, 10 to the 15 GeV. And of course, that's not just a random choice. It has some meaning over TR, right? And of course, T0 is just 3 Kelvin, okay? That's the observed temperature of the CMB today. And so we converted this to electron volts, and this is what you get. So, of course, we don't know what the reheating temperature is, but we write it in this way because we think the reheating temperature is roughly of this order, of order 10 to the 15 GeV. Now, with this assumption, um, um, now, if we assume that there's no, there's not a lot of expansion in the per period between the end of inflation and the start of reheating. Yeah, so that means that if we can say that the end of inflation uh, times H T minus 1 is roughly A R H R minus 1. And of course, if reheat, there, there is, in principle, reheating is model dependent, and so there can be some expansion during that period, but now we're assuming that uh, it's, it's uh, the same. Um, then we can explain the observed 
thermal equilibrium of the CMB. Oh, yeah, I think it's a, no, it's a footnote. Yeah, that's so confusing. If you click on it, it's footnote number 16. <laughs> Not 116. Uh, yeah, I know, that's always when I do a footnote around an equation, it's the, the worst choice. I agree. Yeah. Uh, okay, so we write, so now that means we, oh, sorry, we can write this in the following way. We have a uh, initial, H initial minus 1 is larger than A0, H0 minus 1, which is of order 10 to the 28, uh, TR over 10 to the 15 PeV times E end of inflation, H end of the minus 1. Okay, so this is when you solve the, the observed uh, thermal equilibrium. And during inflation, H is approximately constant. That's what we saw before. I mean, that's what you have, right? In the sit, H is constant, exactly constant, but we're very close to the sitter. And then we find that the total number of E volts is um, larger than Sorry, 64 plus the log, the natural logarithm of TR over 10 to the 15 GeV, okay? So the number of E folds required to explain the uniform temperature of the CMB is roughly of order 60, especially because reheating is probably a little bit lower than 10 to the 15 GeV, so this becomes a not minus sign. Um, yeah, okay, is that clear? So we need, uh, we need about 60 E volts of, of expansion um, during inflation to explain that the, that the temperature of the CMB is uniform. Now again, if we wait longer, if we had, if we had uh, you know, if we ha have a civilization many Hubble times from now, and it still looks uniform, you, you need more expansion, right? More than 60 volts. Okay, um, that's that. Let's move on to the next part. Okay. Okay, so what we need, again, to remind ourselves, we need that d dt, the time derivative of our particle horizon, co-moving particle horizon, uh, AH inverse, is, uh, um, so it has to shrink, right? It has to be less than zero. So we can rewrite this as A prime uh, H plus A H prime over uh, a h squared, and we then define this to be 1 over a, 1 minus epsilon, okay? <coughs> uh, and then epsilon is defined as um, h prime over h squared, which is the same as the log or net, the natural log of H dn. Okay. Um, good. So Another thing here, right, so with this epsilon parameter, it has to be small. And uh, in fact, if we take it to zero, so if you make epsilon zero, then what you find is that um, 
A is actually e to the ht, uh, which uh, is the sitter. So we get back to what we had before. Okay, so um, epsilon has to be small, which means that the cl the clo well, if you have an exactly zero, then it is exactly the sitter. If it's a, a little, little bit uh, larger than zero, it's not exactly the sitter, which also will imply later on that you get some skill invariance, right? So your, your, the, the, the argument to get exactly skill invariant power spectra was based on being exactly the sitter, but it is not exactly the sitter, and therefore it's not exactly skill invariant. And the deviation from scale invariance, of course, will then be quantified by this parameter, as we will see. Okay? Or related parameters. Derivatives thereof, in fact. Okay. Now, another thing. So, uh, so this is one requirement. So, epsilon, this is what we call slow roll parameter, or Hubble slow roll parameter. Oh, let me do it on this one. It has to be less than one. But there's another requirement. So, this is kind of saying, um, um, right, it, it's a necessary condition for an inflationary universe to have epsilon very close to one. But now we have to have uh, conditions that make sure that inflation lasts long enough. Right? It's not only actually getting inflation, but it also has to last for a certain amount of time. So that sets another um, constraint. Okay. Um, and effectively, that is just telling us that there's another parameter called eta, which is defined as the derivative of the natural log of epsilon with respect to the number of e folds, right? So epsilon has to be small has to be small for a sufficient num a number of e foldings, and uh, that is uh, the same as epsilon prime over H epsilon, right? And so for inflation to last long enough, epsilon, sorry, eta also has to be less than one. So we got two conditions at the same time. And this makes sure that inflation happens, happens plus lasts long enough. Okay, so these are the necessary conditions. And you can, in principle, define a whole tower of these, uh, of these slow roll parameters, right? So these are all called slow roll parameters. Or Hubble slow roll parameters. And the reason why they are not, well, there's specifically Hubble here because we haven't said anything, but we haven't said anything about potentials here, right? And so, in many cases, people think about inflation as something rolling down a potential, and then it has to be slowly rolling field down a potential. But here, we haven't introduced potentials at all. But we already have conditions that tell you uh, that tell you the requirements of a successful inflationary period without talking about potentials. Okay, so now. Uh, the question becomes, what's, what kind of model can uh, produce an inflationary period? Now, certainly we know we cannot have radiation or matter, right? Matter, matter and radiation do not meet the requirements of uh, an expanding um, or accelerated expansion. They do not solve the cosmological conundrums. In fact, they are the source of the conundrum, so we should find something else, right? So matter and radiation are not candidates for uh, inflation. And, um, um, and effectively, what we need is, uh, is, is something that has an equation of state, right? So we need something that has an equation of state that's at least less than minus one third, uh, but we'll see that uh, the most natural candidate is some object or some, something that has an, an equation of state that's minus one. Okay, so what kind of theory, what kind of um, component can lead to an equation of state that has this property? Uh, and so 
the people that uh, proposed uh, inflation came up with the following. So they introduced this scalar field, uh, weakly coupled to gravity. Um, Um, with a kinetic term, sorry, it has to be a G mu nu, um, and a potential. Okay, so this is the theory that they uh, propose. So phi here is a, a scalar field, and has only self interactions. There's no other interacting uh, interacting terms, and it has uh, um, and this is usually uh, known as the inflaton. Okay, so that's what they. I'm not sure if that's what they called it, but that's what we call it now. Okay, so that's the model. Now, if we then um, vary this action with respect to uh, the field, then we can get the equations of motion for this field, and they're given by by prime double prime plus three h phi prime plus v comma phi equals zero, and a comma phi here just means the derivative with respect to phi. So that's the equation of motion for this field. And then the next thing we have to do is compute the, um, the energy, uh, the energy momentum tensor, which we can do by varying the action with respect to g mu nu. And if you do that, you can derive that the pressure of this field, um, so p phi, is given by one half phi prime squared minus V, while the energy density of this field, um, rho phi, is given by one half phi prime squared plus V. Okay, so now we get into this whole story of slow roll inflation, right? Because what we need, right, uh, is uh, this equation of state being less than... Uh, minus one third, and specifically something that's close to minus one, right? And that can be achieved if phi is the kinetic term is much smaller than um, the potential. So if this is true, of course, if I then take the ratio of the pressure over the density or vice versa, I get uh, minus one, which is the definition of the equation of state. Yeah, so for this, for this, if this is true, then W is approximately minus one. So we have our necessary conditions for inflation. Any questions about this? Okay. Okay. Okay, so we, we have a toy model that works fairly well, and it's, it's quite kind of um, um, magic, right? Because it's such a simple model, and it produces the right conditions for inflation, and I think that's also why it was very appealing, right? I imagine, um, I guess, all the stuff that, uh, that you've learned this morning and before, then, you know, there are many other theories that are much more complicated than inflationary theory, right? It's a very simple and elegant model. Um, now we can use the second frequent equation to show a relation between um, h prime and uh, phi. Phi prime over m Planck squared. So here we introduce the, uh, the reduced Planck mass squared. It appears uh, everywhere in all these uh, models, and it's just related to the gravitational constant, where here h bar equals c equals 1. OK, so uh, it appears and it reappears in my notes. And <laughs> 
you just have to do dimensional analysis to make sure that it's there or not, or where it should come back if you compute something. Okay. Um, now, given this expression for h prime, we can rewrite the uh, the first slow roll parameter, epsilon. Right? Remember that was our slower parameter, which was defined as minus h prime over. I guess I forgot a minus sign there. H squared, uh, which is three halves by prime squared over one half by prime squared. Uh, plus v. And so again, you see that in order for epsilon to be much, much smaller than 1, v has to be larger than phi prime. So we have the same conditions for slow roll as we uh, got to get, um, to get an equation of state that is close to minus 1. Right? So it's the same thing. Um, okay. Now, you can also, but that's a little bit of work, uh, but um, you should just check my notes. Um, for the second slow roll parameter, there's a, there's a way to rewrite this in the following way. So now I'm writing eta in terms of epsilon. And it's given by epsilon minus delta. And we have introduced this new delta, which is equivalent to minus phi double prime over h phi prime, right? So you see that whenever I, <coughs> whenever you get the second slow roll parameter, there's always going to be some second uh, uh, order deri derivatives, right? Um, because uh, because eta is defined as derivative of epsilon. Okay. All right. Uh, and specifically, if delta equals, when delta is small, what happens then is that if you look at your equation of motion for the field, which I erased, uh, there was this term that is proportional to h. Oh, here it is. So now, if delta is small, then this is the dominating term, uh, which is called the, the Hubble friction uh, term. Okay. Good. Um, now, <coughs> we have not, th these are all exact, right? So, but we can make some slow roll approximations. So the fact that epsilon um, and eta have to be small, um, and be because we can ignore some of these, uh, we can, for example, ignore the second uh, derivative of phi in many expressions then we can uh, approximate or rewrite these slow roll parameters in what is called the slow roll approximation. Approximation. And um, so since epsilon is much, much less than 1. We have that the derivative of phi squared is also much, much less than v, which means that I can write h squared as v over 3 m Planck squared. Um, and since delta is much, much less than 1, I can write 3h phi prime is approximately equal to minus the derivative of v with respect to phi. And that leads us to write epsilon approximately now as m Planck over 2 times v comma phi over v squared. Yeah? So we've rewritten this epsilon now as an approximation. Before we had an exact expression, so we call these the Hubble slow roll parameter, and these are called, or this is called the potential slow roll 
parameter. Okay, so this is, uh, this is no longer exact, but it holds uh, for certain potentials, and we know what type of potentials. It's this whole idea that the potential is very close to, to flat, right? Because if the derivative of v with respect to phi is small, then epsilon is small, okay? And now you, so now you can envision what this means for this inflating uh, uh, universe. And similarly, so then we, we, we just add a, a label here, epsilon v. We could do similarly uh, the same for uh, eta, and we can show that eta v is um, defined as m Planck squared v second derivative of v over v. Right, so now we have a condition for the first derivative, but then also the second derivative has to be small. Okay, what about the relation with, with the existing slow roll parameters? So the Hubble slow, there's actually a relation between these potential slow roll parameters and the Hubble slow roll parameters. Um, which is given by, well, eta v is literally eta, so that's good. And eta v, uh, sorry, epsilon v is, uh, is given by two epsilon minus one half eta. Okay, so they're not the same. And you can actually show this, um, uh, that even this tower of, your, you can do the same thing for this entire tower of slow roll parameters. And in one of the questions, there's even an exact solution uh, for these slow roll parameters. So you, you, you don't really have, you can then later on apply a slow roll um, approximation and still have the, the potential slow roll parameters. Now, finally, we can actually uh, say something about the, the, the number of e-folds. So the number of e-folds that we've written down before, we said it's defined as number of um, a, sorry, d, l, and a. That's how it's defined, which we can write as where we're moving to time integrals from t initial to t end of the Hubble parameter dt. And this can be rewritten as phi initial phi end of h over phi prime d phi. And this equates to finally to phi initial phi end one over the square root of two. And this it's not exact, but it's approximate two epsilon d phi over m Planck. Okay, and this helps you in a way to tell that given um, that n total has to be larger than approximately 60, there is, a, there is a constraint on any inflationary model that you propose, right? It has to abide um, by this, right? So any, if this doesn't have exactly the right epsilon uh, and the inflation doesn't la last long enough in terms of the amount of integration that you're doing here, uh, you don't get the, the necessary number of e-folds. Okay. Um, are there any questions about this? I don't think I have any more. The low, lower bound. This is a, yeah, yeah um, this is it. Um, yeah, this is the lower bound. 60 is the lower bound. An upper bound. No, I think there's no upper bound. Yeah, if inflation could have lasted for a very long time and, and just ha have thermalized, I don't know, huge patch. So there's no, and we cannot observe this patch, right? So there's only a lower bound. Any other questions about inflation? Okay, if there's no questions, then uh, that will be the end of uh, the lecture for today.